Uh, we continue with uh, type 3 hypersensitivity reactions. Uh, we also call it immune complex hypersensitivity. What you have to remember is uh, type 3 hypersensitivity reactions in their pathogenesis are uh, very similar to type 2. Remember, the same antibodies will be involved, IgGs and IgMs, and uh, in type 2 hypersensitivity reactions, immune system makes antibodies against own cells. Uh, in this case, in type 3, uh, immune system makes antibodies against antigen-antibody complexes. What does it mean? Uh, on everyday life, uh, we uh, always exposed to different types of antigens. If you look at this type picture, you'll see the red dots. Those are examples of antigens. This is actually uh, some kind of blood vessel. So every time when we get exposed to certain foreign antigens, our immune system always makes antibodies. Antibodies uh, will come to the bloodstream, recognize uh, their antigens, and will start forming antigen-antibody complexes. What is going to happen next? Next, our macrophages are supposed to come over and remove those antigen-antibody complexes. So this is what is going to happen when our immune system works correctly. But if uh, our immune system has some kind of problems, it means antigen-antibody complexes will not be completely removed from our system then what is going to happen? Uh, those antigen-antibody complexes have ability to be deposited, to get deposited into certain areas in connective tissue. And uh, because a lot of organs uh, contain connective tissue or are made out of connective tissue, uh, so every time when those uh, antigen-antibody complexes get deposited there, they will activate our immune system. They will activate complement system. They will activate macrophages. Uh, a lot of inflammatory mediators will be released in that area. As a result, those patients will uh, develop symptoms of uh, type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. As an example of uh, type 3 hypersensitivity reaction uh, disorders, so we're going to talk about lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, allergic reactions to the um, vaccines. Let's start with uh, systemic lupus erythematosus, or just lupus. Uh, guys, in this case, um, the symptoms of this disorder is going to be a very different and actually basically they are specific for each particular patient and that explains why it's so difficult to diagnose lupus because basically every patient has own symptoms and symptoms actually depend on where those antigen antibody complexes get deposited so if, for example they get, they get deposited into connective tissues of kidneys then Patients will develop uh, inflammation and uh, symptoms of uh, kidney damage. In the skin, then patients will develop uh, skin rash. And actually, uh, there's a very specific type of rash that a lot of uh, patients with lupus will uh, develop is a rash on the, on the face. We call it lupus. Uh, face or we call it also butterfly rash. Why? Because usually that rash covers cheeks of uh, the patient and the bridge of the nose. So as I said in this case, uh, antigen antibody complexes will be deposited into connective tissue of the skin. If uh, antigen antibody complexes are deposited into joints, and remember the joints are made of connective tissue, then as a result patients will develop symptoms of arthritis. Brain means patients will have brain damage. Speaking about kidneys, now guys, even though on this slide it says uh, it's the most common symptom, but you also have to remember uh, that if uh, kidneys uh, uh, get damaged already in the patient with lupus, that is a bad prognosis symptom. Um, usually that is the end of the road for those patients. Next example of type 3 hypersensitivity reaction will be rheumatoid arthritis. What you have to remember is uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, actually affects more often males than females. On the other hand, for example, lupus affects females more often than males. So anyway, 
Rheumatoid arthritis, of course, in this case, antigen antibody complexes will be deposited into connective tissue of joints. And it's interesting that uh, usually the uh, disorder starts from the large joints. The uh, knee, knees, elbows, shoulders will be affected first. And then as disorder develops, then the smaller joints will be affected as well. Next example, type 3 hypersensitivity reaction will be chronic infections. For example, viral hepatitis. A viral hepatitis can uh, cause destructive inflammation of the blood vessels that supply liver. And the last one is a serum sickness. A serum sickness. Uh, you know that some patients can develop allergic reactions to vaccinations, to vaccines. The question is why? Because remember, to make vaccines, we use antigens, right? And remember, the proteins are the most, uh, the strongest antigens. So, um, also, what you have to remember is uh, proteins are the strongest allergens as well, and that explains why uh, some patients might develop allergic reaction to vaccination. And finally, type 4 hypersensitivity reactions, we call them a cell-mediated type, or we also call it delayed type. And remember, we call it delayed type because the time of reaction from 12 hours and can be longer up to a few weeks or sometimes months. Now, what do we call cell-mediated? Because remember, no antibodies will be involved in type 4 hypersensitivity reactions. Instead, T cells will be involved. That's why we call it cell mediated hypersensitivity reaction. We also have to remember uh, that type 4 in pathogenesis is very similar to type 1. It also has two steps, two phases in pathogenesis and same as in the first time, patients have to be sensitized at first. Let's look at this picture as an example. So when, again, patient gets exposed to the certain allergen for the first time, it will activate TD cells. TD cells, it is a type of T helpers. When TD cells get activated, they start proliferating. They start dividing and produce clones of TD cells. But patient doesn't develop any symptoms yet. Then, if the same patient uh, gets exposed to the same allergen, it will activate TD cells. When TD cells get activated, they will produce a lot of inflammatory mediators. It will activate phagocytes, macrophages. They will produce even more inflammatory mediators. As a result, patients will start developing symptoms of type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. As an example of type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, we're going to talk about uh, rejection of transplanted organs, poison ivy reaction, and TB skin test. Let's start with rejection of transplanted organs. Uh, you have to remember, if rejection of transplanted organ occurs before 12 hours after the surgery, that is going to be type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. If rejection of transplanted organ happens 12 hours after the surgery, then it's going to be type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Let me repeat it again. So if rejection of transplanted organ occurs during the first 12 hours after the surgery, after it was transplanted, then it's going to be type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. If rejection occurs later than 12 hours after the surgery, then it's going to be an example of type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Poison ivy reaction. 
we develop poison ivy action because poison ivy has a specific substrate in it. It's called SAP substrate. SAP substrate. It has the ability to combine with the proteins from our skin and it triggers our TD cells. And once again, let's look at this picture. It shows you a pathogenesis of poison ivy reaction. So when we get exposed to, uh, to poison ivy for the first time, it will activate TD cells. They will start proliferating and they will produce clones of TD cells, active cells. When we get exposed to the poison ivy second time, those TD cells will be activated. They start producing inflammatory medi mediators. Uh, macrophages will be activated, uh, produce even more inflammatory mediators. As a result, we develop symptoms of poison ivy reaction. And finally, the last example of type 4 hypersensitivity reaction will be a TB skin test. First of all, you have to remember that TB skin test is not specific test uh, to diagnose tuberculosis. What I, what I mean is um, some patients might develop allergic reaction to, to the substrate that we use to perform TB skin test. And that's why every time when we have patients with positive TB skin test, we have to do chest x-ray. And uh, in, uh, if on that chest x-ray we are able to see calcified lymph nodes within patient's lungs, then we can say that yes, that patient been previously infected with tuberculosis. So let's get back to TB skin test. Um, if patient uh, gives us a positive TB skin test, it means uh, previously patient been already exposed to mycobacterium tuberculosis. It means patient been infected previously. So basically T cells already been stimulated, they already proliferated and every time when we uh, perform TB skin test, which is uh, second, third or fourth exposure for that patient to mycobacterium tuberculosis, every time patient uh, gives us a positive reaction. Now let's get back to uh, of rejection of the transplanted organs as a, an example of type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, guys, you probably know from uh, previous uh, science classes that every time when we transplant organs uh, to our patients, uh, we prescribe immunosuppressive drugs uh, in order to prevent rejection of transplanted organs. As an example on this slide, they give you cyclosporin cyclosporin. Uh, it is an immunosuppressive drug that actually has selective activity. What, what it means is uh, this uh, medication, this drug actually interferes with T cell function and leaves B cell function almost normal. Why I'm saying almost normal? Because remember there are T dependent B cells. Of course those uh, B lymphocytes will be affected by cyclosporin, but at least those patients will have uh, one humoral, activi activ humoral immunity active. Uh, organ transplantation has become an important tool of modern medicine. When we transplant tissues or organs, we have to remember that there are four types of grafts. The first type is called autograft. autograft. That means we transplant a tissue or organ from one part of the person's body to another. As an example, we can use skin grafts uh, for burned patients. Of course, in this case, since we transplant tissue from one part of the human body to another part of the uh, human body, there will be no foreign antigens present and as a result, we do not uh, expect any rejection occurs. Next type is called isograft. Isograft, it is a transplant between genetically identical individuals, twins. 
we can transplant any tissues, any organs in this case. Do we expect uh, any type of rejection? Of course not, because those two individuals are genetically identical. Next type is called allograft. Allograft means transplant from genetically different member of the same species. For example, non-identical uh, people. And uh, of course today uh, we can transplant uh, bone marrow, kidney, hearts, liver, cornea. Uh, do we expect uh, to see any rejection? Of course, yes, because uh, those two people are not genetically identical. It means uh, new tissues or organs will be recognized by immune system of the patient as the foreign antigens. So that means in this case, we will prescribe immunosuppressive drugs to those patients in order to prevent a rejection. And finally, the last type of uh, graft is called Xena graft. And xenograft means transplant from non-human uh, uh, or animals to humans. Uh, do you expect any rejection? Of course. Of course, there will be a lot of uh, antibodies produced and a rejection will be expected. And of course, immunosuppressive drugs will be prescribed in this case. But lately, uh, we uh, do not use uh, xenografts as often as we used to. We are done with hypersensitivity reactions and uh, uh, the last part of our lecture will be all about immunodeficiencies. And uh, remember I told you immunodeficiencies means immune system doesn't work. And it uh, doesn't work, uh, can be partially doesn't work or entirely. So uh, all immunodeficiencies uh, can be divided into two main groups, uh, congenital immunodeficiencies and acquired immunodeficiencies. Uh, as an example of congenital immunodeficiency, we can use a uh, skid syndrome. Uh, in this case, uh, children are born uh, with uh, disabled B cell and T cell immunity. So basically those uh, children are born with no immunity. Uh, usually, uh, those children uh, develop uh, symptoms of this uh, immunodeficiency early in life and uh, they will eventually die from the first infection that they will be infected with. Acquired immunodeficiencies developed uh, later in life and as an example of acquired immunodeficiencies, uh, we can use certain cancers, for example, uh, leukemia, lymphomas, and of course, uh, a very common example of acquired immunodeficiency will be AIDS. And uh, on the last slide of this lecture, you see a picture of uh, a uh, boy, his name was David. Uh, this child was born with a skid syndrome. As you see, after he was born, he was placed uh, into a sterile chamber, sterile environment. Uh, he was fed with uh, sterile food and um, he grew up in that sterile environment until he turned 12. Uh, when he was uh, 12, uh, a scientist decided to um, stimulate or establish his immune system by um, transplanting uh, white blood cells from his sister to him. Unfortunately, uh, those white blood cells uh, were infected with Epstein, Epstein-Barr virus. It causes mononucleosis in humans. Uh, so after uh, those white blood cells were uh, transplanted, uh, boy developed uh, cancer and uh, died died.